I'd like this morning to ask you to think about a time you went to great lengths for the sake of someone else. When was it that you put in an extraordinary amount of effort for the sake of someone else's good? If you have a hard time of remembering something like that, maybe you can remember a time that someone went to extraordinary lengths for your sake because of something you needed. They went that extra mile to help you. I read a story this week about a man named Luke who um, realized that next door to him, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, one of his neighbor's houses burned to the ground. And when he saw the devastation of this house burned to the ground, he was con concerned for his neighbors and found out that fortunately everyone got out safe. Um, the children got out safe, and, and so did their mother. But their house was ruined. It was in total ashes, and they had lost many personal items, including um, this neighbor lost her engagement ring. All of her jewelry was left behind. Again, thankfully, their lives were spared, but they lost so, so much. Well, this man, Luke, decided he was going to go to the extra mile to do what he could to help. And he went to work and found uh, the materials he needed to make a screen where he could sift through those ashes and find some of their missing items, anything that might have survived the fire. And he went to work, and about 5 o'clock that day, after working most of the day, he sent a digital photograph to his own wife that he had found, that diamond solitaire engagement ring for his neighbor. And so uh, he knew and his wife knew that their neighbors would be really grateful for the recovery of that ring. Now some of you who, in our Watula family, who survived the tornado in 2019, and saw all the devastation there. Um, you probably have some memories of times where you helped your neighbors recover from that disaster, or when someone went to great lengths to help you recover. Those are really cherished memories, and they're the sorts of things that encourage your spirit because you see that human beings are good and that they are willing to go to great lengths for each other. But I'll tell you something, no matter what you've experienced and no matter what you've done for anybody else, you ain't seen nothing yet until you've seen what our God does in terms of going to great lengths for the sake of each one of us. In fact, our God will go to any length necessary. He will overcome every obstacle in order to save those whom he loves, and not only save whom, those whom he loves, but also to make himself fully available in relationship with those whom he loves. Our scripture today is coming from Jeremiah, and I just want to remind you about a couple things about Jeremiah. He was the mouthpiece for God as a prophet to the land of Judea. Now, Judea was the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel about a hundred years prior had been destroyed by the Assyrians and all those who lived in the northern kingdom were dragged off into exile or killed and vanished forever. Judea, though, remained as a kingdom and God repeatedly would pledge his fidelity, his loyalty to Judea, saying, trust in me and I will protect you. But what did the Judeans do? They kept looking for human solutions to their problems. They were unfaithful to God and they sought help from the Egyptians time and time again. 
when God was right there offering himself. So a time of reckoning has arrived. The people of Judea were unfaithful to their God, and they have been conquered by the Babylonians and dragged off into exile. They know that the temple has been totally sacked. The treasures of the temple have been hauled off and been brought to Babylon. And many Jews are exiled in Babylon. The people realized this was their own fault. They realized they had done wrong against a God who had vowed a marriage vow with them. In effect, they realized that they had burned down their own house, burned it to the ground, leaving nothing but ashes. But it's in this dark moment, while they're in exile and while Judea is in ruins, that the Lord makes his big announcement through Jeremiah, a promise of a new covenant with his people, that despite their disobedience, despite lacking trust in God and their arrogance of trusting in human power, God has not given up on them. Instead, the Lord promises he will sift the ashes. He will find his people. He will go to great lengths to once again offer to them an engagement ring, promising his fidelity. The Lord promises to overcome every obstacle for their sake and for the sake of bringing reconciliation and union between humanity and God. So hear this, the reading of God's holy word from Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So one thing I hear in this promise of the new covenant that would have been astounding to the first hearers of this prophecy of Jeremiah is that God is going to change the consequences of sin. Truly change them because just a few verses earlier, only three verses earlier, the Lord says that the iniquity of an individual has the consequence of death. You can see this in verse 30 of Jeremiah chapter 31, where it says, But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. That's pretty clear that there is consequence for individual sin, and that will result in death. But in the New Covenant, God says, he will forgive and forget the sins of his people. Now, the first hearers in Jeremiah's time might have really wondered at that. If God is planning on forgiving and forgetting our sins, why doesn't he do it right now? Why does it have to be a future thing? Why do we have to wait for it? If God has the power to forgive sins, and, and he would be the only one, who would have the power to forgive sins, why do we have to wait until later for that? I know at least that's the questions I would have had hearing this prophecy for the first time. Now the Jews, they wouldn't have questioned the goodness of this pro prophecy because in their collective memory, excuse me, <coughs> Thank you. 
In their collective memory, God has always been good to them. He has always gone to great lengths for their sake. All they had to do was reflect on the big stories of the Old Testament to remember how their ancestors started from nothing and were gifted by God with tremendous blessings. Take, for example, Abraham and his wife Sarah. They were past childbearing years, and God came to Abraham and asked him, Follow me, I will show you a land where your descendants will be numerous. Actually, your descendants will be so many that you cannot count them like the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashores. Now, God took Abraham and Sarah, who were barren and sterile and way past childbearing years, and he sifted the ashes of their barrenness, and he brought forth the miracle of a baby born to Abraham and Sarah, even though they were well past childbearing years. And Abraham did nothing in advance to earn this favor from God. God simply called him, chose him, and blessed him abundantly. Another person the Jews would have thought of as one who was greatly blessed by God, one for whom God went above and beyond and went to great lengths for their sake, is about a thousand years later, the Lord recruits Abraham's descendant Moses to lead the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. Now these people had done nothing to earn the favor of God. They simply cried out to him and he heard their cries and he responded with his great love. He was willing and able to sift the ashes of their suffering and to produce a people for himself who were like a, a precious gem to the Lord. From that point forward, in the epic story of Exodus, those people uh, carried the stories with them of all the things God did for them, performing miraculous signs and wonders I think most of us remember some of those miraculous stories that have been told and retold and retold. Do you remember how the Red Sea was parted? And actually before that, do you remember the plagues that God sent upon the Egyptians? And also, do you remember Passover? Amazing things the Lord did. Other things the Lord did through Moses, do you remember when uh, the people were thirsty and the Lord had told Moses to strike the rock with his staff and it produced water? Do you remember when the people were hungry and they cried out for meat and the Lord sent the quail to uh, be eaten by the people and also he fed them with manna? Do you remember? When the Israelites retold the story of Exodus, they were always reminded that God is one who expresses an overflowing and completely undeserved love for them by doing astounding works of grace. God goes to great lengths for the sake of the Israelites. So when they heard this message of the new covenant, it would not have surprised them the goodness of God being willing to forgive and forget sins, but they just might have wondered at how that was possible. But they probably trusted that the prophecy was true. They had something to hold on to because they knew God's character. They had seen him go to great lengths for their sake, time and time again. It sounded right up the alley of a God who was so good to them. Now us, on this side of the cross and the resurrection, we have a further perspective. We know that ultimately 
God went to further great lengths to accomplish this promise, extreme lengths, lengths beyond mere mortal lengths to accomplish the fulfillment of this promise of the new covenant. We know that the Son descended from heaven and was incarnated in an infant child, a weak and dependent child. And then as an adult, he walked the earth to proclaim the arrival of God's kingdom in both word and deed, he proclaimed these things. And he faced the oppression and opposition of the religious leaders and ultimately was falsely accused of blasphemy and executed by the Romans. Jesus voluntarily came to earth and identified with us in human form. Jesus voluntarily offered up his human body to be destroyed, to be ruined like a house burned to the ground. And his suffering and death were excruciating. There was a great price to pay. He was going to great lengths for our sake. And the pain was not only excruciating for him, the Father and the Holy Spirit silently watched in agony as the Son suffered for our sake. And through the Son's identification with us, through his suffering, he accomplished atonement for us all. That is the extreme length to which God is willing to go to achieve this promise of the new covenant. Out of Christ being consumed by his passion for us, God brought forth an engagement ring for all of us that we might enter into a fidelity, a faithful relationship with him. Now we should probably acknowledge that this new covenant, even though it involves forgiving and forgetting of sins, that's not the point of the new covenant. It's a means to an end. God did what was absolutely necessary to do what he intended to do for us, and that included the sacrifice of Christ for the atonement of our sins. Unless that was accomplished, humanity and God would remain separated. There would always be a barrier between us, and it would preclude the possibility of God's ongoing presence in our lives. Now, that's one of the reasons we cherish the Old Testament. It shows us the relationship between human beings and God. And time and time again, the Old Testament shows that the only way that we can be compatible with a holy God is if the matter of sin is taken care of. The matter of our corruptness and uncleanness is taken care of. Otherwise, we are completely incompatible with a holy God. That's why the sacrifices were needed. That's why all those rituals of cleanliness were needed. And even when the priests were doing what they were told to do, and once a year entered the Holy of Holies, they, the, the priest who went in tied a rope around his waist just in case he was struck dead by the holy God. They could haul him out from the holy of holies by that rope. But the new covenant achieved something that the old law and the sacrifices never could. It enables God's intimate presence with his people. As, as the Lord says in Jeremiah, I will be their God and they shall be my people no more shall every man, every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. We're given the opportunity to know God personally and intimately without risking being incinerated by his holiness. And thank the Lord in this new, test, in this new covenant, in this new covenant, we don't need the middleman anymore. We don't need the priests doing the sacrifices and the rituals. In other words, 
We actually don't even need any prophets being the mouthpiece for God anymore. We can hear from God directly. In the new covenant, all people have equal access to God and are invited to know him personally. There's really only one mediator we need. His name is Jesus Christ. He died for our sake, rose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, intercessing on our behalf right this very moment. He is our high priest forever and ever. Amen. But thanks to all he accomplished, the new covenant is here. And through the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, we experience a personal relationship with God, just as Jesus promised his disciples. The Holy Spirit is the helper. Jesus said, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is the, is the fire of God's love dwelling within us, but it's a fire that never burns, never destroys. It's a fire that demonstrates God's love for us, how much he cherishes us. The Apostle Paul recognized very clearly that this new covenant that appears in Jeremiah had been fulfilled with the coming of the Holy Spirit. He wrote to the Corinthian people, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. What Jesus accomplished was that by his blood, by his sacrifice, by his atonement for our sins, human bodies have been consecrated to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. We are thoroughly consecrated by the blood of Jesus. These are the great lengths God went to for our behalf to make possible the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. And it's by the Holy Spirit we're transformed. The Holy Spirit is here in us and among us, not only individually, but as a church body. And not only as a church body here at Watula, but a church body worldwide, the Holy Spirit fulfills God's promise of the new covenant described this way. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. So if we simply invite the Holy Spirit to dwell within us and give permission to God to do his transforming work in us, he will restore us, in us, the image of God. He will write it on our hearts and on our minds, and we will become more and more reflections of his character. We submit ourselves to him, and he imprints himself on us, and we become a holy people, a people who manifest the holiness of God, a people who know the justice of God, and right from wrong, because God is with us. His constant presence is our guide, but he will only do this if we give him permission. We are not just um, objects that can be used um, like in manufacturing. In other words, God does not see us as a piece of vinyl that goes through a manufacturing process and then has music engraved on that piece of vinyl making a record album. We are not a hard drive on a computer that has no choice about the software that's installed on us. No, we are beloved human beings and God gives us a free choice whether or not to submit ourselves to his work of imprinting himself on us. But the thing God wants to do most of all is know us in relationship and offer us the true happiness of being in relationship with our Creator. And not only to know Him, but to receive His blessings and also to receive His assignments, to be involved in His plans and purposes as He has planned from the beginning. But He will always 
give us the option to either receive or reject him. Well, we need to remember the great lengths God has gone to for our sake and recognize that God did all these things not only for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel throughout the Old Testament understands that they are the witness to the nations, that that what God has done has blessed them to be a blessing, to demonstrate God, um, God's character and to share God with the rest of the nations. And we too have a role to play if we embrace that. When we enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and take our place in his plan to reconcile all humanity to himself, we find our true purpose and we experience the true happiness of being in unity with God. So what is our appropriate response to a God who has gone to such great lengths? I hope it's not simply a passing interest. I hope it's not just simply a, a lukewarm confession of sin and a reception of salvation. I hope it's not, I hope it doesn't stop at just an alleviation of guilt and a faith that you'll go to heaven. Because God wants us to know him completely. God went to great lengths so he could give us the greatest gift of all, himself. If you ever want to know what God's greatest dream is, his greatest hope, the thing he wants most of all, you hear it in this new covenant. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's what he wants most of all. What do we want? Do we long for him to be our God? Do we long to be his people? Have we surrendered to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit? Do we want more of him? Do we want more of his love? The new covenant has arrived, folks. God has done all the work to prepare the way. It's just a matter of, do we want to take his hand and walk with him? If we were to reject him, that would be a terrible rebuke of all he has done for us. And I don't know where you are in the decision that, that stands before you, but I hope there are already people among us here at Wetula who are enjoying a profound intimacy with God and a profound love for him. And this is the invitation God offers to us to have full access to levels of joy, peace, and wisdom previously unknown. So let's not stop short. Let us respond to his invitation and enter fully into the new covenant. Let us praise God for the invitation and accept it joyously. In Jesus' name, amen.